commercial breaks filmed round the clock in London, New York and Hong Kong as three men gambled on which way the dollar would turn. Sitting here every day, when things go badly, if you can't uh, keep your cool at that time, you've got no chance, to be perfectly honest. Richard Hill is one of a new breed of men around the city of London. Every day he can win or lose a fortune in a war of nerves against dedicated speculators like Ronnie Schlapfer in New York and William Wong, who plays the currency market from Hong Kong. One day in June, the three of them gambled $1,000 million. Who won? Every day, currency dealers exchange hundreds of billions of dollars into pounds, marks into yen, francs into lira. Some of this torrent serves international trade, but most of it is now hot money, searching for the most profitable home. So lucrative has this business become that banks compete against each other 24 hours a day around the globe, trying to make money out of money. On June the 4th, 1985, commercial breaks filmed simultaneously in London, Hong Kong and New York, with three of the players in this game of electronic poker. In England, it's nearly midnight, and June the 4th is about to begin. Deep in the Kent countryside, Richard Hill is still hard at work, checking the market with his bank's American branch. No, but you've got to remember, the whole world is long with sterling. Oh, OK, you can hang on to early Far East, but I'll get rid of them sort of as soon as the Far East get going. I don't think you're going to make a fortune out of it. In New York, it's still only six in the evening. Ronnie Schlapfer speculates for himself and for 13 millionaires. Today, he's already made $200,000, but Ronnie's an addict. He'll search anywhere to make more. Uh, listen... Can you please tell me how the quotes are for Sterling and Deutschmark in Australia? Yeah, in Australia now it's three or In Hong Kong, it's early morning. June the 4th has already begun. Radio Television Hong Kong, the time half past six. Trading on the European foreign exchanges was erratic and thin. Capitalist Hong Kong is living on borrowed time. Its people know that their buccaneering days may soon be over. So the pace of their favourite activity, making money, becomes ever more frantic. High up in a suburban apartment block, one of the Far East's leading currency traders has just woken up. 24-year-old William Wong comes from a family of currency traders who left China 30 years ago after the communists arrived. Wong's skills are not so much a product of education as of thousands of years of Chinese trading tradition. It's 7.45. Today there are no big news stories from Europe and America to help him decide which way the pound will go. He'll have to rely on his instinct. This morning, William's late. The pound is already rising. He must decide within minutes whether to jump on the bandwagon and buy some pounds in the hope that they'll go on going up. Morning. Surrounded by electronic gadgetry, William is taking the pulse of a market which, at this time of day, stretches from Singapore to Tokyo. William works for the American Chemical Bank, one of the largest banks in the world. Chemical is expanding fast in the currency market. Its dealers take huge risks, but they're well rewarded. William's salary starts at £25,000, but with his colleagues on the currency dealing desk, he shares 3% of their profits. It's a hefty commission, which can double his salary, if he gets it right. If he gets it wrong, William Wong faces the sack. William's in charge of trading the pound against the dollar. It's just five past eight. The pound is still rising, and William's being forced to make a decision. He buys his first three million pounds with chemicals dollars, gambling that the pound will go on up. Now that he's made his decision, he'd like to buy more. 
This 24-year-old can gamble 20 million pounds of his bank's money without asking anyone. Uh, I think it's 13 we go higher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I think the market still looking level to buy sterling. So, um, I'm looking to buy sterling too. So that's why I'm paying 30 in the brokers and uh, see what's going on. If nobody wants to hit me, then I will go in out to buy some more. Within minutes, he's back in the market, quoting a higher price, trying to help the pound up as he steadily buys more. 40.50. Sorry? Okay. 40.50, I do. He's just bought another million pounds. By mid-morning, he's up to 21 million pounds. It could be time to get out before the price falls. Meantime, in London, it's the middle of the night, and in Connecticut, it's late evening. Back home in a house appropriate for an international speculator, Ronnie Schlapfer's checking the news for possible impact on the markets. Good evening, I'm John Rowland. Ronnie's lifestyle depends on his ability to make money for his clients. Thirteen very rich individuals, each with a minimum stake of half a million dollars. The US is just a convenient base. Ronnie is Swiss and his clients are spread around the world but they'll stay with him only if he delivers. Last year, he made them an amazing 50% profit. To do so, he needs to keep at it, day and night, playing whichever markets are open. His last decision of the day is to sell his remaining Deutschmarks. Hi, Brad. I think we should go square, and uh, uh, why don't you sell uh, 26 million marks, and, and uh, we have a look tomorrow. Early tomorrow. We, we call each other, huh? For William Wong, a quick early lunch. He's worried that the pound will fall and he's still sitting on 21 million of them. But the dealing room is never far away. He can check the latest exchange rate on a tiny portable receiver which he carries wherever he goes. Luckily, the pound is up a bit. Now, William has decided that the pound has peaked. It's time to cash in his chips. But by the time that he sells his 21 million pounds, the market will realize what he's doing and the price might fall. So he needs a disguise. He enlists the help of the dealers of the other currencies. If they each sell five million pounds at the same time, the other banks won't realize what's happening and William can take his profit. But they'll have to be quick. They're just waiting for his command. A final check on the price. With a casual wave of five fingers, the first five million goes. The price hasn't moved yet. In quick succession, they sell five million pounds, another five million, and a last five million. And he's out. The sting has worked. A quick check on the price. It's already down a tenth of a cent, but William has beaten the market. Uh, it's a good morning. This morning make uh, 20,000 US dollars. 100 percent enjoy it. <laughs> Once a dealer, always a dealer. Five o'clock news time. This is Nick Page. A bomb has been found on the steps of the Syrian embassy in London. A fourth man has been accused of belonging to a spy ring. Currency trading is an addictive business. His wife still fast asleep, Richard Hill is already getting his first fix of the day 
with a call to his bank's Hong Kong office to see what's happening. And to give a special warning of what he intends to do to the pound for their ears only. Mm. OK, mate. Well, I wouldn't be too long with Sterling, because we'll probably try and bash it down when we get in. Try and look for a quick 50 or 60 points. I guess we do feel some pride in the pound occasionally, but it's not part of our job. I mean, primarily I'm there to make money, so if the pound's falling, I've got to take advantage of it. It's 6.30, a time when no traditional city gent would be seen dead arriving at work. But Richard Hill is no traditionalist, more of a financial athlete than an economic scholar. He started right at the bottom in Barclays Bank. But at the age of 31, he already earns more than most of their high street managers. Hill likes to arrive early to be ahead of the game. His life centres around this huge dealing room. Barclays might have a staid high street image, but when it comes to currency dealing, Richard's up there with the gamblers, and the bank loves him for it. As Barclays' sterling dealer, he sits in the hot seat on the circular currency dealing desk, surrounded by the dealers of the other currencies. I think cable will lead the way down again to cable down to dollar mark to 306. Was that? Was that check. Barclays treats its dealers differently to the American banks. They get no commission, but then they aren't sacked if they get it wrong. Just a gentle push sideways. Sorry? 75 But they're still hungry to make money. Working with tiny margins on hundreds of millions, these eight young men squeeze every penny they can out of the market. Last year, Barclays Bank made over £100 million profit just from foreign currency dealing. At the start of the day, all the banks in the world are party to the same information. It's a question of whether you make the best use of the information during the world. It doesn't look like there's much of a trend at the moment. So as I say, we'll just play the market on people's positions, really. And take a bit of profit out of it. That still means bashing the pound this morning. So with London still mostly asleep, he calls Barclays Hong Kong on his computerised dealing screen. What's cooking, he asks. And he then tells them that he wants to sell some sterling. And the amount? Ten. Their shorthand for ten million pounds. Barclays Hong Kong spread the word, trying to tempt other banks into buying. It's early afternoon, and William, flush from his morning success, is a likely candidate. He decides to call Barclays London direct to find out their latest price. Cable Chemical Hong Kong, 49.54. In London, Richard quotes a competitive price to tempt William into buying. And William falls for it, buying five million pounds. Lose five. Five million of Barclays pounds have just travelled to Chemical Hong Kong. As Richard sells more, the price falls. And within ten minutes, it's down half a cent. The five million pounds that William bought is now worth 20,000 pounds less. In this small duel, Richard has scored. William is gracious in recognising a competitor's skill. Well, it's a good deal. Why do you say that? 
well, sometimes uh, you, can, you can see a scream, he can lead the market. <laughs> it's eight o'clock in the morning in London, and the world is quiet. No coups, no assassinations, no new crises to rock the currency markets. Now Richard's boss, Chris Pavlou, has arrived. I find it's a big one sandwich, don't you? Come on, man. It's a big one sandwich. I'll have a dose of cups of coffee. Eh? Yeah. I'll have a dose of cups of coffee. Are you an organiser, then? Chris Pavlou used to be one of the world's biggest sterling dealers, but now, pushing 40, he knows he's too old for the game that he loves. There's nobody on that desk. It's over 35. People start in the, um, in the early 20s for about 10 years, and by the time they reach their very early 30s, they had about enough. As you can see now, the market is, is having a small breather, but the dealers cannot afford to lose their concentration for one minute. They started at 7 o'clock this morning, and they're going to be here at 5 o'clock. And the market, whether it's quiet or busy, they've got to keep their adrenaline going. They've got to make sure the concentration is, is there, just in case uh, the market decides to, uh, to erupt. Now, with Richard's opening gambit over, an even bigger player is entering the market trying to buy 20 million pounds with its Deutschmarks. Perhaps it needs these millions to buy a lot of British goods, but more likely the Russian, otherwise known as Boris, in reality the Bank of Foreign Trade Moscow, is speculating that the pound will rise. Richard calls Moscow direct to find out what's going on, prefacing his message with the customary, hi, hi, friends, they could easily be bluffing him. They could be buying a little to push the price up before selling a lot. John, I think the Russians find sterling marks elsewhere now. But Richard guesses that they must be buying from other banks too in a big operation as the pound begins to rise. Thanks. Hear that? Richard thinks Boris is buying sterling marks elsewhere. So he decides to risk jumping on their bandwagon using the other traders to ring out and get prices so they can hit the market with tens of millions as quickly as possible. 50-55. You want to go and buy a bit of sterling? Looks like, looks like everybody in the market might be a bit short of sterling. It doesn't want to go down. 58-63. Take five. His first five million pounds, and with each wave, he buys another five million. <laughs> Quickly, it's going to go up in a second. A grimace as the price rises. Take five. Take five. Take five. Take five. That'll do. That'll do. He's bought 35 million pounds. Richard and the Russians, between them, have helped the pound up half a cent. But now taking the profit proves irresistible, so Richard starts selling. If you're looking for an offer, you've got it. If you're looking for an offer, you've got to say my day, you're 85. How many years? 20 points profit. Between 18 and 19, I want to sell. Sorry. 1995. Yours. Yes. A brief speculative bubble has burst, but Richard has won again. Uh, what you saw, we bought 35 million pounds, we went up 30 points, we decided to take our profit. So how much money did you make on that little bubble? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Okay, <laughs> 75,000 pounds, I mean, uh -huh. about 75,000 pounds. <laughs> He's the best in the world because he said he has learned his trade um, the hard way. He started getting the sandwiches when he was uh, in his early 20s and he was kicked about by the other dealers and um, he has no um, ego whatsoever. If he's wrong, he knows he's wrong, he will cut out and he will say, I had enough, I'm not going to beat the market and he's there to, um, to work for back this bank.
Switzerland is at work 17 floors above 3rd Avenue, Manhattan. Unlike Richard and William, Ronnie's dealing room is his own, and his business is 100% pure speculation. Sure, sure. How, how do you guys see the dollar? He works with a partner, ex-Harvard man, Brad Westerfield. With their two young assistants, they spend most of the day sitting and waiting for the right moment to plunge in and buy. Can you talk to Mike? The thing is, if it breaks this level, don't pay higher than I do. Right. Don't pay higher than I do, okay? This morning they think Deutschmarks look good, so they're buying already. We used to be more aggressive, but the market changed uh, completely. So uh, at the moment, the way we trade, we just wait and wait, and when we see a situation, then we jump in very fast, very quickly, and uh, then it has to be right. If it's not right, we cut it, and then we stay away again. At 45? Oh, that's fine. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Bye. Yeah, 23 and a half, okay? By currency dealer standards, Ronnie works long term. He might even keep his marks until tomorrow. In London, some important financial news is due in under half an hour. The latest money supply figures will almost certainly have an effect on the pound, but nobody knows which way. Richard is gambling that they'll send Sterling up, so he's bought 20 million. But now Sterling is falling as other dealers place their bets. Than gambling or something you don't know about, to be honest. In Hong Kong, William is out celebrating another good day. He only broke even in the afternoon, but he managed to hang on to his morning's profit. <laughs> After buying and selling 120 million pounds, he ended the day 20,000 pounds up. But once a dealer, always a dealer. William likes to keep in touch, day and night. Sixty. Those money supply figures are due out any moment. Fifty again now. Five hour again. In London, as the price wobbles, tension is mounting. Okay. You turn these figures around in about two seconds. Above half a percent and the pound should rise. Below and he'll be in trouble. What? 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 Upper half money supply. Oh, that's the top right. It's bad news. He wants to sell, but this time he doesn't succeed in beating the fall. In New York, it's now nearly noon, and they're already jumping into the market again, but not because they want to. Hi, this is uh, CMI. Can I have a dollar mark, please? While Richard can hang on, they're being forced to quit yeah, as their marks fall. 95. Just checking around the market now, we found out that some Eastern Bloc countries were buying dollars and selling pounds very aggressively. And uh, so basically we're just forced out of the position. That's something we, we have no control over and we had to take a loss. We took about an $80,000 loss. If we hadn't gotten out of it so quickly, it would have probably been a loss of uh, $130,000, $150,000. And uh, it's just one of those things you have no control over. And we just try to take our losses quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> With the kind of trading we've done this morning, it's ready to be at lunch. <laughs> oh, it's just erratic. Up and down and choppy. Ronnie and Brad's loss for the day so far totals $70,000.
Now they're out at lunch, wooing a prospective client. An inevitable question soon comes up. One of the very uh, touchy areas that the Middle Eastern has usually asked is the fee structure. Uh, could you sort of elaborate on that a little more? Yeah, of course. Uh, there is a fixed uh, management fee. And then uh, we have an incentive fee, performance fee, yes. uh, which we charge once a year. Now that cuts that, in when you reach a certain figure, I suppose. Right. That's, that's, right. that's on a graduated scale, which basically amounts to uh, levels around 20, 25 percent of the product. So uh, the fees are, of course, a little bit high, but... Uh, sure, but the, the growth is so dynamic, I think the fees are so that's right. shattered and by... Yeah. Don't forget we work 24 hours. Right. Good night, Neil. In the 10 exhausting hours that Richard's been at work, the pound has moved up and down two cents. He's made just under £100,000 for the bank, buying and selling 750 million of them. How does he feel about handling such huge sums? Oh, no, really, I don't know, really. To be honest, I never really thought about it, because you do it every day. It just comes naturally. But surely his antics affect the pound. Long term, we can't have that much influence on the market. I mean, it depends so much on commercial demand. Uh, day to day, we can probably move the rate our favour, but as I say, nothing dramatic long term. The guy is like unbelievable. I can't take it. I'm trying to help him. I'm telling him we were giving dollars elsewhere in 20. Oh, well, that was before you called me. In New York, they're getting edgy. Uh, did you leave a limit order? Talk to me about a rate. Did you leave anything or you just told them to execute? Just do it. Oh, do yeah. it. They want to sell marks, but they keep missing the moment. They should call out and ask a price. Okay, we pay, we pay 30. All right, raise, raise my bid to 30. I'll pay 30. But this late afternoon trading is just going to be, a, it's getting to be a casino. So whoever buys the next, uh, buys or sells 100 million and just moves it one big figure and it's just, and it means nothing, you know. I mean, on, as far as the next 24 hours. It just makes everybody run, they get in, they get out. Always at the bottom of the top and. It's unbelievable. Okay, unbelievable. By the end of the day, Ronnie was lucky. The afternoon position with a loss turned to a profit, and he broke even. Ronnie, Richard, and William, between them, made over a hundred thousand pounds through this day, buying and selling more than one billion dollars. They made some of that money from other dealers, but most of it comes from companies who need foreign exchange for investment and trade, and even from holidaymakers on their way abroad. The banks provide all of them with a good, busy marketplace, but by dealing so much with each other, they add to the speculative froth of what has become a very wild business. It's the price the world pays for a free market in money.